would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died. John 14, it says, because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. If we stay grounded in Him, 
we can rest assured that anything that comes our way in this life, we can overcome because he has overcome death and overcome the world. believe in the sun I believe in the risen one I believe I overcome by the power of his blood Amen
This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture. Help us on my side Angels descending Bring from above Echoes of mercy Whispers of love This is my story This is my Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. Hold his head rest Loud in my Savior In happy and blessed Watching and waiting Looking above Filled with his goodness Lost in his love this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Father, we thank you and we praise you this morning, for you alone are worthy to be praised. Father, we thank you for the story that you have written through our lives, the testimonies that we have of, of salvation provided through your Son who was sent for us. Father, we thank you that the salvation that you provide is, is made for us to walk in, in obedience to you, and to your goodness, your grace, and your mercy, Father, that we would uh, live for you as representatives for you in this world, Father, that when they see us, that they would see you through us, that we would take the command that you've given us to be the salt and the light, and, and Father, that we would live by that, and then, Father, that they would see us and, and see you through us. And it's in Jesus' holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning, church. Why don't you go ahead and take a moment, greet someone around you this morning. Welcome them to Grace Gospel Church. All right, good morning, church. Good morning, good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Grace Gospel Church. We are so glad that you are with us on this Sunday morning. Good to be in the house of the Lord together. 
once again. We do want to let you know that there are welcome cards in every seat pocket in front of you. Uh, that might serve a few different purposes. One, if you uh, have been here for a while and you just have some information to update, you can uh, use that as your resource to do that. Or if you are a guest with us, you're invited to fill one of those out. Uh, it's a great resource to be able to connect with us here at Grace, and we can connect with you, uh, plug, plug you into our weekly newsletter that we send out on Wednesdays uh, to keep you in the know on ministry and all things happening here at Grace Gospel Church. While we're upstairs in main service, we do have two ministries that happen downstairs. Kingdom Kids is for newborn to preschool. That ministry actually opens up uh, right before service even, so you can bring your kids down there for that. And uh, Super Church is kindergarten through second grade and third grade through sixth grade. So kids, you are now dismissed to go ahead downstairs for Super Church. All right, a few announcements with a few different events coming up uh, over the next few weeks. So one, uh, our ministry Graceful Mops is meeting this coming Saturday right here at the church at 10 a.m. Uh, coffee and snacks and refreshments will be served with that. Uh, Graceful Mops is a ministry that we offer uh, for parents, uh, for moms of newborn uh, to pre-K. And uh, so moms, you are invited to come out and be a part of that. You can sign up today on the back table to be a part of that. Uh, child care will also be available right here at the church. So moms will meet uh, upstairs and then child care will be available downstairs uh, for those kids that are in that age range as well. Uh, so come on out and be a part of that uh, fellowship and a great time together for uh, moms in that uh, in that range right there. So with, with kids, uh, again, newborn through pre-K. And uh, also with Graceful Moms, I want to let you know too that tomorrow uh, they're having a little play date with the kids. And so you can join them at 10 a.m. at Sayville Marina Park. And so moms, you can come on out to meet them there and bring your kids with you. And it'll be a great time to be together. So that's happening tomorrow. And then the, the ministry for moms specifically is happening Saturday. It's a monthly ministry. It's happening Saturday the 16th at 10, 10 o'clock. All right. Uh, also coming up in just a few weeks is our Thanksgiving family dinner right here at Grace, Sunday, November 24th at 5.30. Uh, super excited. This is an event for the whole family. Uh, we want everyone to come out and be a part of that. Uh, you can sign up on the back to bring either a, uh, a main dish, a side dish, or a dessert. And so just make sure you look at the back table and sign up for you and your family and indicate uh, how many will be joining us. Uh, it's a great, great event. Uh, dinner will be happening downstairs, but then we're going to set up upstairs uh, kind of like a basement like you would with a family dinner. Uh, we'll have video games and board games and all sorts of stuff for you to enjoy with your kids and the kids to come on up, upstairs. Uh, it's a great event that we put on, and so we want everyone to be a part of that. Sign up on the back table today to join us at 530 on the 24th. Our ladies' Christmas brunch, believe it or not, Christmas is right around the corner. Uh, so our ladies' Christmas brunch is also right around the corner, happening Saturday, December 14th from 10 a.m. to 1230. And we want you to know, very important, that tickets go on sale next Sunday after service. Uh, it'll be $15 per person. You can see Miss Carol Cachetto. Uh, she'll be in the back selling tickets for you beginning next Sunday. Uh, super important to know with that as well that seating is limited. Uh, so we want you to invite your friends, invite your family members, invite your coworkers, your neighbors, whoever. Uh, invite them, but make sure that they're coming before you buy a ticket because seating is limited, all right? So start asking people this week. Know that they're going to come and then buy your tickets next Sunday. And uh, it's going to be a great time for our ladies Saturday the 14th, 10 a.m. to 1230. Plan on being a part of that. Uh, I have another announcement. I'm going to invite Pastor Patrick to come on up and uh, tell you a little bit more about that with our expansion project. I agree. <laughs> nice. That had to be Jack. Way to go, Jack. You're my man. <clears throat> All right. Good morning. Good morning. Hope you guys are well. A lot of things happening. So um, <clears throat> two weeks ago, we had a little meeting after church for uh, our church members and um, we talked about the expansion project next door and how that's moving along. As a matter of fact, we can see the finish line. Praise God. We've finished just about everything on the parking lot. There's just one or two more things to do there. The house is coming along nicely. We're hoping, I don't know, two, three months, maybe, I don't know, uh, that that can be done as we get everything. We're almost about ready to sheetrock everything and get all that done. So, 
But costs were a little bit more than we had anticipated in the beginning for a lot of different reasons that we talked about. If you're a member, you should have gotten an email about two weeks ago from me. And so this morning, we're doing a vote. And the vote is just to approve the needed funds to complete our expansion project. Um, <clears throat> we figure it's going to be about 50000 or so, probably a little bit less than that. Although we've asked for seventy so that we don't ever have to come back again because we're... It's just embarrassing to keep coming, you know, to have to come back. So, um, if you're a member, there's a ballot in your bulletin that we ask that you would vote. Uh, yes, obviously, is to go ahead and approve that additional needed money that we need. We need you to print your name and to sign it. Um, <clears throat> if you're not a member, or if you don't know if you are a member, then you're probably not a member. <laughs> Because you would have stood up here and we would have done that. So, um, and we're not trying to exclude, but this is just kind of that time where we get to approve that. So, um, you'll do that. And at the end of service, Brian Young will be in the back with a basket. You can just put it in the basket. If you want, you can put it in the offering box, however you want to put that in. Um, <clears throat> but they'll count votes uh, after everybody is gone and, and the service is done. So, Brian, again, will be in the back. Please. Please just vote on that. That's the way we're doing that. Quick, it's not really a meeting, so you don't have to stay after to have a meeting at all. You just have to vote and put it in a box, again, if you're a member. Okay? Makes sense? Hopefully it does. Um, <clears throat> you might ask, Patrick, how are we funding that? Um, what we've done is we've asked our membership or all of our people to um, just continue the... You guys have been awesome in our giving and into that expansion project and into everything, actually. And uh, we are asking that you would extend that six more months. So officially, the campaign officially ends in December. We think we'll be able to pay the mortgage off by February completely. Um, so no mortgage at all uh, on that house. And, um, and then hopefully, you know, just all the needed funds that we need. So we're asking six more months. All of our leadership, elders and deacons and staff have committed to do that, and so we ask you to join us to do that. Okay? So that's where we are. All right. Um, <clears throat> if you have any questions, like if you're like, oh, I got to ask a question before I vote, you can come talk to me. You can talk to Brian, um, and uh, we'll answer any questions you guys have. Okay? All right. Let me pray as we enter into God's Word. Father, I love you so much. I thank you for uh, your love for us. I thank you for this church. This, I mean, I just continue to be amazed that you would even allow me to pastor this church, and I'm so thankful for them, so thankful for the people that you brought here, Father. I pray, Lord, as we come before you today for your Word, I pray that you would meet us in this place. I pray that you would um, talk to us individually, even, Right now, Lord, we always pray that it's not, this is not for the other person, this is for me. And so, Lord, would you just meet me in this place, meet us in this place as we interact with your word that your glory might be seen. We love you, Lord. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. So we're kind of in a three-week mini-series within a series uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians, right? And so uh, we've entitled this whole series, A Letter to a Local Church, because that's really what it is. And you might recognize that church in the background right there. Uh, you're sitting in it, in case you don't. Um, <laughs> uh, not because I think in any way <laughs> we're like the Corinthian church. As a matter of fact, studying for this, I praise God several times a week. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have the kind of issues that the Corinthian, Corinthian church has. <laughs> Um, or had, but it doesn't mean there aren't issues, and that doesn't mean that there aren't little things that happen, and Paul deals with these issues because they're real-life issues that happen in local churches, especially uh, in the Corinthian church, in the culture that it was in, and what is interesting to me about the culture that it is, and it is very similar to what we have here in America. As a matter of fact, I've told you this many times, right? Uh, Papa Vic, Vic Horvath, uh, when I first taught on this or even talked about it, he said, boy, you could talk, basically call it First Americans as opposed to First Corinthians because we live in this culture. We live in this culture that is uh, self-focused, self-centered, self-gratifying. You know, it's all about me kind of culture, at least I'm first kind of culture uh, that we live in. And that's, that's where we are. Um, and that's 
what you have, and in that, a local church exists, and we're one of them that exists in that. And so Paul is dealing, like I said, in this little mini-series, in this bigger series, of what do you do with, how do you deal with some issues correctly in the church? Last week, we talked about church discipline, where you have some people or some body specifically in the Corinthian church um, that was living in unrepentant sin. And we're talking about repentance sin, right? Because we all struggle with sin. That's not the issue. The issue is not that you struggle with sin and you allow God to speak to you on that. The, the issue is that you walk into that and then you live there. And so Paul dealt with that last week. If you want to hear how we did, go back and listen. You can listen online, gracegospelchurch.com. Go to our YouTube page and the message will be right there. Um, today, we talk about kind of an interesting issue um, that specifically talks about legal disputes. So let me ask you a question. I don't know how this would apply. I don't know what you're talking about. What do you do if you buy a house from another believer and then there are some discrepancies that happen in that? What do you do if you hire a brother or a sister uh, contractually and something doesn't feel like it's met and you feel like something happens or, or damage happens or when it, further than the extent, I don't know, stuff like that. What do you do if there's a dispute that, that really kind of feels more like a legal dispute in some sense? We don't often like to even bring it to that attention, but that's, that's what he's talking about here. And, and in our country, at least, I, I think we really have this attitude of kind of don't tread on me. You know, don't take advantage of me. Don't, you know, I got to protect myself. I've got to watch out for myself. Um, we got to watch our own backs and all that we do because, listen, I mean, you're the only one watching out for you. That's kind of how it goes. And so um, we, we tend to, I mean, we know this, right? We, we got to be careful in everything we do because somebody doesn't like what you do or if you offend them, and, and they feel like they have a case, they'll sue you in a heartbeat. That's our culture. I, I know people that, that that's their first answer. I'm going to take them to court. So, so what happens, like I said, when you have those kind of issues amongst the brethren, amongst Christians who are God-fearing, God-lovers, and yet you still have that kind of dispute. And, and again, even where there is not blatant offense, listen, I'm a, I'm a believer in contracts. I think that's a good thing when someone contracts on your house to do something. That's good because it lays out what's going to be done. But sometimes there's, there's kind of things in there that doesn't fit. You, you can't just make every single thing fit. So what do you do about that? And so that's what we're talking about this week. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, as we talk about this kind of thing. And I know we go, well, this, boy, that, that doesn't happen. As a matter of fact, I've not, I've pastored three churches. I've been a pastor for 29 years. I don't think, I don't remember that I've ever had somebody in my church uh, with another member in my church take somebody to court. Now, I do know there have been businesses that have been in court and maybe even amongst brethren. Um, so we think, well, maybe that's not our issue. Why do we even preach this? Well, we preach it because it's the next passage, and we preach the whole counsel of God here. Um, but the reality is I need you to see the attitudes behind it, and, and it will become really applicable, I think, to all of us in how our attitudes are. Matter of fact, that's what, you know, Paul is hard. I, I made a statement on Tuesday morning in Bible study. I, a lot of people don't like Paul. A lot of people don't like Paul. And, and some of that's because he gets all up in our business. I mean, he gets all up in our business. He starts talking about, like, nitty-gritty kind of things. And that's really what we're talking about, kind of some nitty-gritty kind of things. All right, so let's talk about this. First and foremost, I think what Paul says is that disputes should be settled with the help of the church. Disputes should be settled with the help of the church, something that we don't even think of sometimes. Look at verse 1, chapter 6, 1 Corinthians. 
Does any of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will not judge the angels? How much more matters of this life? So if you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges who are of no account in this life? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, no account in the church. I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not any among you, not, I'm sorry, not among you one wise man who will be able to decide between his brethren or brother goes to law with brother and that before unbelievers. So obviously in Corinth, um, most commentators will say these are matters of property almost always, whether it's land issues or, or yeah, I don't know, just property issues, but but the culture there is, is that there's something wrong and we're going to take it before the court so that we have a binding agreement that we have to follow the Roman law to do it. And so since you won't do it voluntarily, and that's what happens, right? I think you're wrong. I think that, that you should have done kind of this extent or not this extent or not charge these extra charges or however that goes or I thought we were going to get this and not that with it. And so I bring it to you maybe in some fashion, and too often today, I mean, even when we buy houses and mortgages, we hire lawyers to be on our side. Um, Why do we do that? Because we need someone to be able to read the legal language, right, because you're going to throw it at us if, if it's just not clear cut. And so, and so we have this disagreement, we, we send our lawyer or we send somebody else or we talk about that this is in the contract, and when you disagree, we're going to make you follow it, or we're going to make you agree with the interpretation, but we're going to put it legally binding on you by using the courts to do that. Again, sounds a little weird, right, in that sense, and yet <clears throat> Paul says, why would you go before the unrighteous to settle a dispute with a brother or sister in the Lord and not take it before the church? Again, we don't think that way. The church isn't into legal matters. And and too often, we kind of separate our lives out and we think church is church and business is business. Church is church, and like my financial matters and my dealings and business and all that, that's, that's, you know, the church doesn't understand that, or the church can't be competent enough to judge that. And Paul says, are you nuts? Would you rather go before the unrighteous? And then he says, do you not know that we're not going to judge the angels? Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to you know, judge matters of the angels. It does mean that we're going to stand over them as we reign with Christ in the millennial kingdom. And so, and so if, why, why would we not, oh, this is going to be a hard word, sorry, submit ourselves to the church rather than to submit ourselves to an unrighteous legal system? Why would we do that? Why would we do that? Um... It's a struggle, right, and it's an attitude, and again, it's something that is, I would tell you, that's foreign in concept. Rarely have I had anybody come to me in disputable matters outside of marriage matters or, or, or raising children matters or those kind of things. Rarely have I seen somebody come with a disputable matter where they say, I need, you to, I need you to judge between us, or can you give me somebody in the church who could judge between us and will accept that? It's called binding arbitration. You can get an, an arbitration person separate, except they're saying you choose somebody else. Now, I know of people in this church who have done that. They just haven't done it in the last 15 years. 
So Paul, that's the, that's the issue. Why would we go? Now, Paul steps back a second, and he says, the, matter of fact, we've already lost if we're at that point. If we're at the point where we're so mad or so offended or so I don't even know the word. <laughs> I'm trying to think of it. You know, so taken aback and, and so, so feel like there has been such an injustice amongst brethren for contractual matters that I would take you to an unrighteous court. He says we've lost already. We've lost already. As a matter of fact, he would say that our attitude should be one of be wronged rather than defame Christ. Be wronged rather than defame Christ. Look at what he says, verse 7. He says, actually then, it it is already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? On the contrary, you yourselves wrong and defraud. You do this even to your brother, to your brethren. And again, that's where attitude comes in. I'm just going to say, listen, we, we get offended at our brethren. And, and what's interesting is we've talked a lot in the, about the Corinthian church, about divisions that we've had, about sin. And, and so often we've come back to the fact that it all comes back to attitude. And it all comes back to this place where we tend to circle our wagons around what we think or what we want or what we do, you know, even if it's about camps, well, we just really think this. And, and uh, I mean, listen, I, I just, honestly, I thank God the election's over. Whether, no matter whether you thought your, your candidate won or your candidate lost, all right, um, the, the reality of it is Wednesday morning, whoever won, God was still on the throne. God's still king. Praise the Lord. And we still stand under him. There's no political saviors out there. There are just no political saviors. What there is is a, is a church that needs to be godly, that needs to be, not to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to live it out in a manner that, that would speak something to the world. And that's what Paul's talking about here. What does it look like when... And, and you might remember, so it's a little easier if you have a dispute with a brethren um, to a, another Christian for them not to be in your church. In Corinth, there was one church. And so they were in your church. They were in your body that you fellowshiped and worshiped in, and now you're going, and that's, again, where we just have this attitude that, well, you know, church is church, faith is faith. But business is business, and so we're going to take it to the business realm of that. So he says, which is better, win the fight or glorify the name of Jesus? That's the question of our attitude. And again, the reason that this kind of stuff even comes up is when there's a perceived attack or, or perceived offense, and sometimes that means about my money, And when it's about my money, it's really serious then. And we just throw up our defenses. And and we begin to fight. And we take that posture of fighting. And instead of simply apologizing, if there's a wrong, we just just do what we got to do to fight. We just do what we got to do to fight. That's what we do. That's what we do. Um, Matter of fact, there's a, a, you know, we, we talk about this in psychology, a fight, flight, or a fight, flight, or freeze syndrome. We've added to freeze since when I first started studying this. Um, and, uh, and, and that's what we do, you know, often. And, and often, again, when it's about those kind of disputes or legal disputes, we, we, we kind of take it to heart and we kind of take it to the law. Um, or, or we freeze, sometimes we do that, and then we're just completely offended and we'll talk all over the place about it. And we'll even talk about people's relationship with the Lord and we'll talk about all kinds of things that happen. Um, kind of crazy, kind of crazy. Why do we do this? Because we're proud and we're offended. 
and we're conditioned that way to fight. Jim, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor because I forgot something. Can you go in my office, on my desk, there's a book called Business by the Book. <laughs> All right? That's what happens when you forget things that you're going to bring up to service. Thanks, Jim. Um, I remember Mike Boyle. Mike Boyle was our district superintendent when I was in Minnesota uh, for the Northern Plains District. And we had a situation. I was the, I was the um, chairman of the board. Thank you very much. I was the chairman of the board uh, for our district out there, and we had had a, a dispute, and unfortunately, we had had several disputes amongst pastors and churches, you know, where the church has an offense against the pastor, that kind of thing. And uh, he specifically talked about one situation, one pastor, and he talked about the fact that, um, that this church was bringing something against him or, or offended by something. I don't remember the issue, to be honest, but he, but he said this about the pastor. He said, you know, really, probably the pastor was not wrong um, uh, about what they were accusing him or whatever about this attitude that he had. The problem is, is that he became wrong. And how he responded to that. And, and what he did is he pointed to Job. And he pointed to the fact that Job in the beginning was not in sin in any way. Right? When God allowed Satan to, almost like he said to Peter, sift him out like wheat. Um, it was not because he was in sin. Not because he had done anything wrong. As a matter of fact, it was a testimony to his witness before God. And Job in the beginning stood up strong. The Lord gave, the Lord take it away, take, takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. I will praise him no matter what. And then his friends come and they begin to argue with him about the fact that, well, something must be wrong with you because bad things have happened to you, and so it must be your fault, it must be something inside of you, it must be something you did. And Job begins defending against himself against his friends, but then begins to defend himself against God, so much to the so that he goes, listen, if I had my day in court, I'd show God. <laughs> Until finally God can't take it anymore with Job, and says, <laughs> Job chapter 38, says, gird up your loins like a man. Like, here it comes, baby. Let's see if you can take this. Gives them two chapters of where were you. And then finally Job says, all right, I'm just going to shut up. And God says, oh, I'm not done with you yet. And says exactly the same thing. Take up, you know, gird up your loins like a man and let's go again. And then he gets to chapter 42. And he says, I'm done. But then Job says this about God. He says, you know, I had only heard of you with the hearing of my ears, but now I have seen you with my eyes. I've learned something new because my pride took over. And see, that's what happens. You might not be wrong in the beginning, but our pride takes over. <laughs> Done it? Our pride takes over and we begin to like, whoa, wait a second, that's not right. And we, we get our, the hair up on our, on our necks up and, and we want to fight. And then we gather around people, we tell them what's happening, and then they want to fight for us or with us or tell us how we should fight and how we should just go about doing it. It's a tough thing. Now, I got Jim to get me this book. I like it. It's, it's by Larry Burkett. Um, Larry Burkett was the Dave Ramsey of his day. Uh, if you know Dave Ramsey, financial guy, Larry Burkett was the financial kind of Christian of the day um, back when I was first a Christian. And so he wrote a book, Business by the Book, for People of Business. And he talked about offense. I'm going to read you a, a kind of a long passage out of that to talk about this man. Again, um, when they had this situation of control in a company, and, and what do you do with that? You take it to court. All right, here you go. Richard was the half owner in an electronics manufacturing firm. His partner, Gene, was a brilliant engineer who had developed several patented products which their company manufactured and sold to other companies. The business was divided into two basic areas, research and development under Gene's supervision and sales under Richard's authority. The idea was to have equal but separate responsibilities, a great concept, he says, that rarely works, if ever, if, does it work. He said, for nearly three years, the business had just barely gotten by financially, Richard ran the business side of things. Gene ran the engineering side. Then one of the products became very successful, and the company was launched in a big way. For the first time, they had the capital to move into a facility that would provide adequate office and manufacturing space. But suddenly, 
Richard found himself in frequent arguments with his partner over equipping offices versus buying additional test equipment. He apparently doesn't understand the need for an office environment that would be more comfortable for the employees, Richard thought, as he walked away from their meeting. In his mind, he went back over the conversation they just had. Listen, Richard, Gene had said, I don't see why it's necessary to spend $20,000 on office furniture and carpets. I need all the capital that we can get our hands on right now to develop new computerized, a new computerized version of our equipment. But we've already scratched the surface for the sales of the last unit. But we've hardly, sorry, scratched the surface of the sales of the last unit, Richard would argue. If we come out with another model right now, we'll kill the sales for the existing units. I suggest that we hold off on the development of the computerized version for a while. Besides, most of our customers don't really need the computerized model. They don't have the volume to justify the additional cost. I want to start on the new model, Gene said with final emphasis in his voice. The, this business has been built on my design so far, and now I finally have the funds to do some research. That's great for DuPont or for GE, Richard countered. They have the product base to support their research, but we don't. We need to sell what we have and concentrate on repackaging it for use in smaller companies. I'm not going to spend my time redesigning hardware. I'm not going to spend my time redesigning hardware, Richard. I need to work on new ideas. I know you'll have the market for them. Don't worry about it. Maybe we'll redo the offices next year after we've completed the design on this new line. Richard realized that he was considered a lesser partner because of his lack of technical experience. But he also realized that the best product in the world was worthless if it didn't sell. And Gene was intent on pursuing his own interests regardless of the need. Looking back, Richard realized that they had avoided discussing any details of their partnership. Since they were both Christians, they assumed, that happens a lot, they would be able to work out any difficulties that they came up with. Now he was seeing another side of his partner. The business was simply a means for Gene to pursue his interest, design and development of new equipment. Richard was there to sell Gene's products to allow Gene to develop more. Richard decided that he had three choices. Quit the partnership, fight for his rights as an equal partner, or allow his partner to have control of the business. After praying about his decision and discussing it with his wife, Richard came to the conclusion that he should give a portion of his stock in the business to Gene, thus securing his partner's position as majority owner. The next day, Gene came into his office. When Gene came into his office, he found an envelope with one share of stock enclosed on the desk. He was confused. He had assumed that Richard would fight him for control of the business. In fact... He and his wife had discussed the situation and decided that, if necessary, they would go to court to maintain control. Staring at the stock certificate, he realized that Richard had done voluntarily what no court would have imposed upon him. He walked over to his new junior partner's office. Richard, why did you do this? He asked in a subdued tone as he held the certificate in his hand. Well, I prayed about it. And Donna and I decided that either we believe what the Bible says or we don't. The Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Since we do not know, since we know that there can't be two heads of a business, I figured this would settle the issue. So you just tell me what you want to do, boss and I'll do it. Gene just stood there, not saying anything. He knew that God had just taught him a lesson in humility through his partner. He replied, I guess I'd like for you to pray with me, Richard. As you know, I've always had a problem with pride. I never could have done what you just did, not even under a court order. I feel like a giant, I feel like a giant coming out in his battle attire only to be met with a king, by, a, by a kid with a slingshot. It says, Richard and Gene spent the next half hour on their knees in prayer together. This became their routine over the next three years. They were in business together. 
From that day on, Gene never attempted to mandate a decision on Richard. Instead, he would present his ideas and then ask his, for his partner's perspective. Without exception, he followed Richard's leading in all business decisions, including research and development budget. The business was eventually purchased by a larger company that made Richard the director of marketing and Gene the head of research and development. And then Larry says, it just proves what it says in Proverbs 22.4, the reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. I love that true story because the reality of it is most of us would have never done what Richard did. Never. We would have fought. We would have argued. We would have struggled. Um, if we would have backed down, we would have been bitter. And yet he went before the Lord, and he decided to live out what the Bible said. Um, now, for them, it turned out great. Doesn't always turn out great. And yet the question is, isn't that what God wants us to do? Right, again, back to that verse that he quoted, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interest of others. Does that not apply in business? Does that not apply when you have a case? Wouldn't it be better... Wouldn't it be better that you would lose so that Christ could win? Again, that's a, I'm going to tell you, that's just, that's just real life faith, you know, faith down the walk right there of what, of what real life is. Because almost everybody would tell you that's stupid. Almost everybody, except one, God. Whew, all right. Then Paul gets into the last issue. And his point is this. Because that's, 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 that's living a whole lot different than what we would think that we should do, right? But Paul says we're called to live differently from the world because we are different. Paul says we're called to live differently from the world because we are different. Because we are believers in Christ. Look at what he says in verse 9. He says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators or idolaters or adulterers or the effeminate or homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. <laughs> Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of God. Again, Paul comes back to remind us about the world, right? It's what he did in earlier chapters. Um, and, and the question is, do we, do we really follow the world's wisdom? The world's wisdom that, that doesn't view God as the author of creation, that doesn't view God as the authority, do we really follow the wisdom of the world that just says, listen, what is practical is what's good. However, I want to live is just fine. And so everybody has a different standard of what they want. And God says, don't we know that, that, that those who live that way, those who don't want the things of God, those that don't follow God, will not be in the kingdom. So why do we live their way? Why do we do the pragmatic, practical thing that just makes sense to us because everybody else does it? As a matter of fact, you might remember, that's why Israel got a king. They didn't get a king because God had said, you need a king to rule over you. They went, oh, look at how all the other nations behave. Let's have a king. So instead of following God, the king, they followed a man. And most times than not, of all the kings of Israel, uh, most did not follow God because they got into that power and they had that power play. Um, again, that is who we were. That is what we were. But we are different now. That is not who we are now. And I love 
Chapter, I mean, verse 11 is a great reminder, right? That's who we were, some of us, right? We struggled in sin. Everybody does. And we gave ourselves to sin at times before Christ. But he says, that's not who we are now. We're washed. We're sanctified. We're justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of God. What we are today is we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then we say, yes, God. Well, what's the question? Does it matter? We say, yes, God. And, and what we're really out for is we're out to glorify him, not to get the most we can. Or not even get what we think we're due to get. That's a tough one. Well, I'm just looking for a little justice here. I'm just looking for a little bit of, 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 of justice because I thought that this is really how it reads and the way I read it, this is the way, whatever. I mean, whatever. We can get really technical. We can get really jargon-oriented. And then when we want God's righteousness shown, all right, Lord, I need you to come down. Now, will you use this unrighteous system to do that? Now, can God do that? Absolutely. But why would we? Submit ourselves under that when we can submit ourselves under the righteous, under the things of God, right? We may be in the world, but we're no longer of the world. We're now children of God. That is who we are, and that is what needs to define us. And again, that's really hard when I just don't want to. It's really hard. All right, let me give you a little bit of application on this. Um, <clears throat> first of all, let me say this. There are times that we need a court system. <laughs> matter of fact, it's set up by God. I mean, God says that's a, that's a good thing. As a matter of fact, especially when there's a, you know, we're talking about non-criminal legal matters. When there's a criminal legal matter, the government, Romans chapter 13, has been, set to set, has been set up to punish the evildoers, to punish those who break the law. And so we need that. And there might even be times when <clears throat> something happens that it's so... So, I don't even know what, where we need to go. But maybe it's so big or so inclusive of so many that that needs to happen. Um, so I'm not saying the court system is bad. That's not what I'm saying, okay? I'm just saying why do we submit ourselves uh, in non, non-criminal matters when we don't need to, okay? Secondly, and this is a long one, um, when you humble yourselves before others, you may lose materially. And listen, I'm not saying that you might not lose materially, but God will lift you up and you will win spiritually. You will. Why? Because, because the kingdom of God is, is, is about what we're about, because God is glorified, right? Our mission statement, I need you to hold on to this. I need you to repeat this self you know, in your life if you're wondering, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? God, what do you want me to do in this situation? What exalts Christ in this situation? And how, how will this point others to Jesus? And that's his whole point in the court system, right? What is it going to look like when we're fighting with each other amongst the unrighteous? Oh, look at them. Christians are just like everybody else. In other words, Jesus makes no difference in their life. That's what they mean when they say that. And so why would I want that if it doesn't make a difference? Why would I want that? But when you humble yourself, when you live out Philippians chapter 2, when you're not looking for what you're going to get, when you're not trying to gain what you have. You remember what Jesus said, right? Matthew chapter 5. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. He said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I serve Jesus. Yeah, but if your treasure is in something else, trust me, that serving Jesus will wane and might even die off. Um, there's, there was a big movement a long time ago. Um, it was pithy. It was not always bad, 
Sometimes not always. Whatever. <laughs> what would Jesus do? Remember, what would Jesus do? Now, there's a lot behind that, and you can talk to me later about why some of it was, mm, I didn't love it all. But, 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 and this is a big but, um, what would be right before God? How do I exalt him? Or in other words, in this situation that I am in, how can God best be glorified in this response? When something happens with you or amongst somebody else, whether it's legal or not, whether it's, whether it's relationship or not, whether it's tension or not, how can God best be glorified in my response? And that's not only just in the momentary response, that's in the continued response of that. Now, again, that is hard, especially when you feel like you've been wronged. That is hard, especially when you feel like you've been wrong. Emotions get in the way. Pride gets in the way. All kinds of things get in the way of that. And the question is, what is best for the kingdom? You know what I know doesn't glorify God? James chapter 1, verse 20. He says, the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. I got to tell you that I... I I, I love that verse, not because I'm like, yeah, let's preach it. It's because it's preached over me too often. As I allow my emotion to take over and my anger of the situation that is unjust or whatever to go, and then I want to take it, and then I let somebody hold it because of that, right? The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. So what does? That needs to be the question in this. And again, we're talking about court issues, kind of weird. We don't really have a lot of those, right? And yet, you see that it really is about an attitude that's pervasive all over. Maybe even in marriages, in, in work relationships, not just up and down, but over in, uh, in contractual matters. Wouldn't it be better for God to be exalted than for me to win in this situation? Because what matters is the kingdom and not about my kingdom. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, I love you. I thank you for your grace and mercy. I thank you for uh, these great examples. I thank you for how you reach us and how you meet us in a place, Lord. And this seems a little outside of ourselves, but maybe when we look at it a little bit better, it really is about our attitudes. Lord, help us to have attitudes that reflect you. Help us to have responses that reflect you. That responses in, in what we do and, and how we do that, that your glory might be seen, that Christ might be exalted. And even in those tough times, in those maybe justified fight times, where I choose Christ over myself, Lord, that you might be exalted and that others might be pointed to you. Lord, God, would you meet us in that place? Would you meet us in the place that we are? Would you meet us where our heart is before you? And would you do a work in us to your glory? I love you, Lord. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And renew a right spirit
the joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord. Take joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within me cast me not away from thy presence O Lord take not thy Holy Spirit from me restore joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within me and renew a right spirit within me and renew a right spirit within me Man, I'm going to ask you to just sit in that for a minute. You can sit, you can stand, you can kneel and do whatever you want. We're going to enter into a time of communion. And so we're going to say goodbye to our, our Facebook crowd, our live crowd. Uh, 